So this is Anna Sheborowska, and I practiced it, and, uh, and I didn't quite get the V at the beginning, and she's going to be talking about music transcription. You've given her a big hand already, but do it again and enjoy the talk. Hi, everyone. I've just found out that um, I have five minutes less than I thought I do, so I'm going to rush, I guess. Hope it's fine. Uh, my name is uh, Anna Przeborowska, <laughs> and I work uh, as a software developer in the music industry in a company called Ableton. At Ableton, we produce uh, three main products. Uh, the main product is a big software. It's a digital audio workstation, which uh, allows musicians to record, uh, edit, and produce music. Apart from that, it was actually designed as uh, an instrument that you can take on stage and perform live, hence the name. Uh, next thing is Link. Link is a technology that allows people to play together uh, on electronic devices thanks to syncing them in time over a uh, wireless network. And last but not least, the training beauty is actually something I work on at Ableton. <laughs> this is an instrument that allows you to create your music musical ideas without uh, looking at the computer, uh, although it's connected to life. Um, yeah, but let's get back to the topic. So what does it mean to transcribe music? Transcribing music means um, transforming the audio recording to a music notation. What it means you just like write down what you hear with uh, notes that can be interpreted by other people. There are some, uh, some people who have like superpowers of doing it on ear. I'm not one of them. <laughs> My ears haven't been properly trained to do it, so that's why I prefer to figure out how to teach my machine to do it for me. So let's uh, have a look on what we need to, uh, to do to perform that. So first of all, we have to figure out how to read the audio stream. We have to think of what it is, what it's going to be, and how to read it and store it so that we can later process it. Then how to figure out that the note actually occurred and what note it was. Was it like C? Was it E? What octave it was? And then um, transcribe it. So write it down in um, some standardized way that could be interpreted by other software, other electronic uh, instruments, or even other people. Okay, so um, let's go in steps. First question, how to read and store data? First of all, we, we need to know what data it is. So our audio input is basically a continuous, continuous um, wave, for, um, wave that we unfortunately can't just like process like this with our computer first, we need to digitize it, of course. Uh, digitization comes into steps, sampling and quantization. What does it mean? So sampling basically changes it, uh, the signal to a sequence of samples, so we end up having a finite set of samples. How many samples? This is determined by a sampling rate that we uh, choose. So a uh, sampling rate uh, defines how many uh, samples uh, will be picked per second. Um, there is also one important thing that we need to remember of while sampling, which is like one of the basic and most important things in the whole digital signal processing, which is so-called Shannon or Nyquist or simply sampling theorem that says that you have to make sure to be able to later restore the continuous signal we had uh, on our input to be, uh, to be able to restore it, we have to make sure that our frequency components in our digitized signal don't co contain frequency components above half of the sampling rate. What does it mean? It, um, like, what happens if you have like higher uh, frequencies in there? Uh, then this frequency comes in and wants to represent itself in our uh, sample data. So what it does, it, kind, it tries to assume a different frequency that it's on, which is called aliasing. So it kind of takes an alias and like totally affects itself. Which, and uh, aliasing is like a double curse, because first of all, of course, we lose the high frequencies, but we also corrupt our low frequencies, because we don't know anymore if the frequency we have there is actually the one that belongs to the original signal or is, um, is there because of aliasing. Um, so yeah, just make sure you pick up the right um, sampling rate. The usual one is uh, 44.1 kilohertz, and it allows us to basically encode everything that's audible for human being because we hear something 
uh, in the range from about 20 to 20k um, hertz. Okay, then, so now we have our independent domain uh, that uh, contains a finite number of, um, uh, of things, like finite number of samples, but now still our uh, dependent variable, it's not uh, finite yet because each value can be any float. So, but let's say we wanna encode our information on a um, set number of bytes, let's say eight, and we want to have only like 256 numbers available for encoding data, which means we have to quantize the data. The uh, most simple thing to do it is just to find the nearest quanti quantization level, so the nearest possible value to um, assign um, to a sample, so like just correct the amplitude a bit. So both sampling and quantization end up like restricting how much information we end up having in our digitized signal. Um, okay, so we know what we have when we read, uh, um, read our audio stream. It's gonna be like probably rather large array of data. We'll have to figure out what things to choose to, uh, like what data types to choose to store it. And then what we wanna do, we wanna detect nodes. So first of all, we wanna say, okay, the node occurred. We here have a plotted recording um, done on this wonderful thing. Uh, the seconds of it, we can see exactly like, I just played two nodes, right? It's quite easy to see on a, a plotted uh, waveform. We will have to figure out how to, how to calculate that. Okay, and then we know that I played two nodes. Now in a spectrum graph, we can see that these were dif different nodes, right? Because there are uh, significant peaks in different frequencies. Um, okay, and uh, last step is to think about the standard, how to encode our nodes so that other software understands that later. And uh, let's get our questions again. We need to read and store, store data, figure out how to do that, how to detect nodes and how to represent nodes. And before we go any further to my suggested implementation of that, let's see what we're aiming for. So, aiming for, so the demo time. And a million things can go wrong right now because it's an uh, real-time audio processing. Um, I'm sure it works, <laughs> uh, but just a small caveat. Ghost notes may appear due to all the noise around, but let's see how it works. So I'm gonna play this beautiful thing that's been with me ever since I was in elementary school probably, and I'm gonna use it one more and probably last time in my life. I have this microphone here that I'm gonna play to, and I'm not gonna play fancy melodies. Uh, I'll tell you later one, just single notes. Okay, let's see if it works. Um, I'm gonna, uh, so I'm gonna ask my um, algorithm to detect a note, uh, detect its speech and play it with a different sound. Let's see how that works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Still better than expect expected. <laughs> All right. Um, so what happened here is that we read chunks of data at a time and we processed them, trying to uh, trying to figure out if a note occurred and what note it was. Then we create we created a, a note in the standardized format, send it to the synthesizer that produced a different sound, the sound of the piano. Okay, so how did we do that? I read the data uh, using a Pi Audio library, which is basically, a, um, these are Python bindings around uh, Port Audio, which is like a cross-platform library enabling you to um, play and record uh, audio in real time. Uh, it supports blocking and non-blocking mode, non-blocking mode, uh, is based on just uh, calling callbacks in a separate thread. That's what we're doing here. Uh, so you basically need to instantiate a Pi Audio object, create and open a stream, in our case for uh, reading the data. Um, tell it what data format you want, how many channels you're gonna read, and what is the callback. And most importantly, you need to start the stream and make sure the main thread doesn't die, doesn't terminate, you know? So you, we need to keep it alive by like putting some, like a sleep there or something. 
Um, so let's see how the call, um, what the callback looks like. Uh, we receive a data, frame count, number of data, uh, time to status flag. Um, our data is a string at this point. And um, what's most important, it needs to return the frame count frames and a flag. Status flag tells our uh, stream uh, if it should continue feeding the data, uh, it happens when we uh, pass PA continue flag, or if it should terminate in that case. Um, uh, yeah, we, we uh, put a flag to say PA complete, yeah, stop doing this. Um, okay, what's next? Next we have to figure out how to store our data because like as here we're getting strings, not the best type maybe for data manipulation and calculations, I think. Mm? Yeah, so the data is string here, so that's why we um, convert it to a NumPy array. Why NumPy array? Because it's like hell more efficient than Python lists uh, due to internal implementation, even though both implementations are in C, like just because Python lists allow you to put like different type of objects in the same list and it needs to store the information about the type. Uh, it can't really use the vectorized implementations, hence it can't really optimize uh, operations I'm gonna abusively use um, doing this. Um, not too efficient. NumPy arrays though, speed up things massively. Um, okay, so, and also like give us for free some um, rather complicated and cumbersome, com um, but very popular and common um, operations on big matrices like uh, convolving uh, or like making uh, transpose, transposing uh, matrices or like even we get fast Fourier transform for free. Okay, uh, so now we read our data. Now we wanna uh, see if our current chunk of data, something changed and did not occur. Here, um, I plotted short time Fourier transform of our uh, recording from previous example. Uh, what, what, um, what does it mean that it's short time for your transform? It means that uh, the recording was uh, divided in chunks and for each chunk we calculated power spectrum to see the energy changes of the spectrum in time. Um, this way we can uh, distinguish if like uh, there was a significant change in our uh, spectrum assuming like uh, another period. Uh, what have we don't do that uh, in our real-time implementation because like we analyze each chunk of data at a time but basically we did the same. We calculate the power spectrum of it and we try to compare it with previous uh, spectrums. So as we want to uh, measure how quickly the power of our spectrum changes over time, um, we do it using so-called spectral flux which is basically the difference between the current uh, power spectrum and the previous one. And it's plotted with a green line here over a uh, short time for your transfer. Um, okay, so we could uh, find the peaks in here already, but there, is, uh, there are some minor peaks that we might end up, uh, end up ending up finding and we don't want that because it's kind of a noise. We apply so-called thresholding function which is basically we choose a number of chunks that we average and multiply by a given constant uh, to make sure we, uh, and we are like basically only interested in picking peaks that are above the given threshold and uh, the values that are bigger, non-zero values that are bigger than the previous value. Uh, in here we can see that thresholding function could be better because it still leaves behind some uh, peaks we don't wanna uh, choose in my implementation thresholding function like reaches far uh, higher because I wanted to make sure it's not too sensitive in an environment like this um, so it probably performs better but these two uh, parameters the number of chunks we're gonna average and uh, the multiplier is basically uh, the parameters that you can change to adapt your um, to make your application perform better Okay, now um, we picked the significant peaks here and we want to find um, what pitch these note, notes had. Uh, we do it by calculating so-called sepstrum of uh, a signal and sepstrum 
is an inverse uh, Fourier transform of a logarithm of the calculated spectrum. Easy. <laughs> In like simple words, it's kind of a spectrum of a spectrum. So uh, that's a way to think about it. And basically you can treat it as the information of, uh, about the rate of change over time. So it's kind of a measure of time, but you shouldn't think about it as of a signal in time domain, but it's kind of co co correlated with the time in, um, in that. So we all know that frequency equals one pair time of a single cycle uh, of the wave. So uh, knowing that uh, in our frequency domain, frequency is a domain of uh, substrum, they're all like uh, playing with words, spectrum, substrum, frequency, frequency. Um, frequency is like, it uh, represents uh, like the time uh, cycles. So like the high frequencies will be like have shorter time cycles and they will, re they will be represented at the beginning of um, a frequency domain and then uh, the lower frequencies at the end. Here, so before we start picking our, um, finding our uh, fundamental frequency in this substrum, we want to actually this is already narrowed, so we want to narrow the substrum to the frequencies we are interested in. I narrowed the frequency to uh, frequencies to ones corresponding to like eight nodes. I would probably be willing to play tonight. Um, yeah, and uh, so it's like pretty narrow range. And we can think of it like so th these frequencies are from 500 uh, hertz to 1200 hertz. We can also think about them as narrowing it to. 80 microseconds of a time cycle to two milliseconds of a time cycle that corresponds to 500 hertz. This is how a spectrum works, more or less. Okay, so knowing this, uh, we pick the maximum value, which in our example was between 25 and 30. And okay, we have the in, like the value in frequency domain. We have to now transform the frequency to frequency because that's what we are interested in. To calculate it, we simply divide the sample rate by the um, Sepsion peak index, which kind of um, is derived from what I've just tried to explain. <laughs> so in our example, uh, this is what I mentioned, we are narrowing the, um, the Sepsion and, um, and then find a peak in the narrowed substrum, but then well, actually when we are trying to figure out what was the uh, fundamental frequency, we had to remember that the peak index should refer to the original substrum. That's what we do, we're doing here. And we figure out like saying, okay, it's the value of it uh, ends up being 689 hertz. Okay, now uh, it's also nice to mention that by the like, pitch detection applies a slight correction to our onset detection because then we can just ignore the, the onsets that are out of our uh, the frequency range of our interest. Okay, now we found the notes. Now we want to encode it in a thing that can be later understood by our synthesizer. So what we do is, um, so what we do is that we uh, choose something ready to use, something like use massively and everything, MIDI protocol. MIDI stands for uh, Musical Instrument Digital Interface and it basically, uh, it can code like a note and velocity, um, like the pitch and velocity of our notes. Um, the messages, uh, MIDI messages we're um, interested in would be note on and note off. Note on means start playing a note, note off, stop playing a note. A uh, message consists of three bytes, as we can see here. Uh, in the first one, we say what uh, kind of a message it is, what channel we're using. We have 16 channels to use. Um, second data byte has um, our pitch encoded. As we can see, it's on seven bytes, just uh, 128 values. And the last one is velocity, meaning like velocity is the strength of uh, the note being played. So it means like we perceive a note being played louder or softer. Okay, so this is how we transform frequency to MIDI note uh, number because as we can see, we only have seven bytes to encode our pitch, meaning the maximum value would be 127, but our frequency before was 689. So how do we encode that? Well, like this. <laughs> 
Um, and this is the uh, some part of a chart <laughs> that actually tells you what node in what octave has what MIDI number and what frequency. And as we can see here, our um, some of their our uh, found node of frequency 698 uh, hertz is um, is a note F in uh, seventh octave and has a MIDI number 77. Okay, now we know uh, what our node is, what uh, we can encode a MIDI message and we can send it to a different instrument. I chose a um, library called uh, PyFluidSynth, which is also a set of Python bindings around a thing called FluidSynth, which is a basically software that allows you to play sound fonts that uh, encode instruments um, in real time. And yeah, that would be it. Um, uh, what are the conclusions? Python is amazing for rapid prototyping. Um, I wouldn't really use Python probably for production code, but to just um, check some, like check out different uh, ideas, solutions, or like even try out different pitch detection algorithms, it just it works like, like the charm. The whole thing that we've seen uh, now, it's not a lot of code. We, you can have a look, um, it's on GitHub. Um, it's been on GitHub for the last like two hours, I think. <laughs> so, um, still, um, the um, sound font that I used now, it's not uh, pushed there because it was too big. So you have to like uh, download your own, but they're available online, it's no problem. And Okay, so why is it so good for rapid prototyping? So first of all, thanks to amazing numerical libraries that I briefly discussed before, like NumPy makes things much easier. Hail NumPy. And of course, um, IO operations in Python are like pretty simple. Um, no much messing around, like um, that's really useful. And the um, API of the wrappers I used are really good and they make the code look very clean and very readable. So, yeah, that's it. That's all I have had prepared today. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do have four minutes for questions. This hand went up immediately. Hello. Hi. Two questions, actually. First, you need a very good microphone or whatever works? Microphone? Yes. No, not very good, but I just brought this one because the laptop microphone like, gets the noise from all around. Like, okay. Also, that's how it's designed. This one is more like pointing my direction. <laughs> and second, what about instrument identification? I mean, knowing that it's a piano or a guitar or a violin or a... Uh, it's a different thing. So um, distinguishing between, like, so different instruments would have different spectra spectral um, features, and then we would need to analyze different things. Like, um, we would probably we wouldn't care about the energy distribution over time. We would rather um, care about of energy distribution at all. Like, you know, because like different instruments would probably have different characteristics in, uh, yeah, in this. So this would be probably, um, yeah, completely different things to analyze. Although having similar <laughs> concepts. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for the talk, it was super good. Uh, quick question, so this is for mono, so if there's like one uh, melody and only one note playing at the same time. Yes. Uh, what are the main sort of challenges or maybe sort of advice that you might have if you want to do this for chords? Yes, so the problem with chords is that like uh, it's hard to dis distinguish what notes were played because the frequencies overlap. And um, if I had a very performant um, algorithm now to present on um, like transcribing chords, I would probably be a PhD by now. <laughs> and so I'm certainly going to try out some things, but the solutions available by now are no more um, uh, efficient than 70%, so it's a rather complicated thing. Um, I still think I'm going to work and try out different things. Uh, a very interesting concept is a CQT transform. Uh, you can have a look. Uh, this is what people tend to uh, like try to use for polyphonic um, music uh, recognition as well. So, but yeah, that's why I didn't try it. <laughs> 
More questions. There you go. We had the same question. Uh, you know uh, that there is a story that says that uh, Wolfgang uh, Amadeus Mozart, when he was a child, he heard uh, a full play of a piece of music and he mm -hmm. was uh, able to transcribe from his memory all the piece. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your system is able to, to uh, hear a full piece of music and and print in music notes all the piece, like Mozart? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, the, the problem, uh, so uh, this version and this version pushed to GitHub uh, works only for real-time input, so um, uh, one chunk at a time, when one note at a time. Uh, I initially implemented it for um, analyzing uh, the whole like uh, pre-recorded things, uh, files and uh, so actually it can recognize notes and pictures of it in time and like uh, reconstruct like a create MIDI notes uh, with like keeping the time and and uh, pitch and so on but unfortunately the problem uh, as discussed with um, uh, by answering the different question would be to like uh, have a polyphonic music transcription which I don't support yet so that would sadly not work maybe in the future I hope. <laughs> That's a direction. We have time for one more question. Uh, I'm thinking about it. Uh, so uh, you can uh, make recognition of uh, monophonic music. Uh, would, uh, do you know about some implementations uh, that also let a user uh, teach the algorithm about something like this is the noise, uh, don't uh, interpret it or uh, this is my uh, color of instrument, don't uh, interpret anything else. Uh, is it any approachable? Uh, because even in Ableton, I uh, see different algorithm for harmonic detection, different mm -hmm. algorithm for melody, for uh, rhythm, and uh, no any uh, method for a supervised uh, detection. So, uh, uh, so is it practical? Uh, is it practical at all, or is it, it was it would be too difficult mm -hmm. to implement? I'm not sure. I completely understand the question. Like, would it be only to only transcribe one instrument, or only? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Uh, like, I could say uh, to algorithm that I want it to transcribe this and don't trans transcribe that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, such uh, to now uh, detect your ghost notes, like here. Yes. So, so, this is a noise and it interprets it. Mm -hmm. So, maybe you could just uh, put this noise to algorithm and uh, it would learn that it is just mm -hmm. noise. Yeah, so I mentioned before, I think like pr maybe you would first have to have like a um, kind of um, um, instrument recognition, like, you know, like uh, to uh, find out some uh, spectral features that would be able to determine, like, you know, the, the instrument that you want to sort out or something. Um, not trivial to implement, I guess. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's on radar, uh, but it's certainly an inter interesting thing. I think so you just probably, yeah, first of all would have to um, try different, like try out, um, like checking different spectral features, like what is work, works best for distinguishing between different instruments, um, like what tracks the timber or something. And then just apply it as your uh, filter <laughs> for, for the feature detection. Um, that would be my idea of how to approach that, but unfortunately, I don't know of any ready implementations like this. Be uh, there are people who are trying to like separate separate in instruments, and it's the same problem. Like the frequencies overlap, the uh, characteristics are sometimes too similar. So, um, yeah, I don't know of anything that, that would perform well or would really work. And that's all we have time for. So uh, I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking Anna Jevorska.